escapes gravity. All celestial and terrestrial bodies, without exception, mutually attract and fall towards each other. This is what Newton maintained in the 17th century with his theory of universal attraction. Standing upright seems natural enough, but it's not as straightforward as all that. Indeed, it's gravity, the attraction resulting from the enormous mass of the Earth that conditions our balance and which holds us on the surface. But that's not all. History tells us that one night, sitting beneath an apple tree in the light of a full moon, Newton realized in a stroke of genius that an apple's fall to the ground was due to the very same phenomenon as the moon's movement around the Earth. Both fall under the influence of the Earth's mass. Both are attracted by the Earth. Sure, but the moon doesn't fall, it turns. Of course, because the moon has momentum. It has a direction and a speed which enables it to resist gravity to a certain degree without being able to escape it entirely. If it didn't fall, it would continue its motion in a straight line ever further away. It's the balance between its momentum and gravity that determines its circular orbit. And gravity has other mysteries in store. Really? When material bodies fall, they all fall at the same speed, whatever their nature. For example, if in a vacuum you were to drop a piano and a feather... Great idea. They both hit the bottom at the same time. At the same time? And yet... I know. On Earth, it's the resistance of the air which slows falling objects. But in a vacuum, the acceleration caused by gravity is the same, regardless of the nature of that object. Sure, but those are just words, totally abstract. Not at all. Imagine a lift. Paul is playing ball inside. If we cut the lift's cables, Paul, the ball, and the lift begin to fall all at exactly the same speed. The same thing happens inside a space shuttle. The shuttle, the occupants, and the objects inside all fall at the same speed. They are subject to the same force of attraction. So the impression we get is that they're floating in space. That's weightlessness. Yes. It's a property of gravitation which we call the equivalence principle. And how did our friend Newton explain this mysterious phenomenon? Well, in fact, he never could explain it. But at the beginning of the 20th century, Einstein became interested in the equivalence principle which seemed to him a kind of key to the structure of the universe. And he discovered the secret links which unify space, time, light and matter, the four basic elements of our universe. in which the straight line seems totally absent, where one has the impression that only curved motion is possible. In fact, in the universe, all natural motion is curved. The straight line is a kind of idealization. Nature is naturally curved, but we must distinguish two kinds of curvature. One, 
purely spatial, and the other, introduced by relativity, space-time curvature. What do you mean by space-time curvature? When a body moves in space, its space-time trajectory is simply a schematic way of representing its accelerations and decelerations. Take our little rocket, for example, which is moving at a constant speed in a straight line. Yes. Its spatial trajectory, like its space-time trajectory, is straight. Okay. But what happens if your rocket begins to accelerate? Its space-time trajectory is curved. Really? Why is that? Because the variation in speed is in fact a variation in the relationship of time to space. Okay. And if we represent space-time differently with space along the horizontal and time along the vertical, we get a first trajectory where there is no variation in either direction or speed. Here's the trajectory of the vehicle slowing down. And here, it orbits a star. The space-time trajectory describes a helix. It traces a helix? If the vehicle accelerates, the helix punches up, as it covers a lot of space and little time. If the vehicle slows down, the helix stretches upwards because it needs more time to cover the same space. And you see the space-time motion of the planets trace the same pattern around the sun. Like a helix developing around the sun's timeline. trajectories forms a curved surface, that is a surface over which one can only move via curved paths. of curved surfaces give rise to a curved space, that is, a volume from which all straight motion is excluded. And lastly, the evolution of curved space through time generates a curved four-dimensional space-time. applied to a body in motion changes its speed. It either speeds up or slows down. And usually, the force also modifies direction. On a cosmic scale, celestial objects are also propelled by a force, that of gravity. bodies in the universe are affected by it. <laughs> 
So gravity does not just create weight, it also creates the curvature of trajectories through space and time. And what about light? Does it still travel in a straight line amidst all these curves? Before Einstein, many scientists believed that light wasn't influenced by gravity. It was thought that light traveled in a straight line and that it wove a rectilinear web which defined space. So we can imagine the structure of the universe like a huge rectilinear network within which bodies follow curves and ellipses. Not exactly, because the theory of relativity changed our conceptions. Time is elastic. It varies with speed. According to Einstein, light rays themselves are also subject to gravity. Normally, a star sends its light to us in a straight line. But if a massive body, such as the sun, for example, happens to lie in its path, the light ray bends. Considering the shifted direction of the light ray, the star seems to be displaced. All this may only be observed during a solar eclipse, otherwise the sun would blind us. It was during the solar eclipse of 1919 that the bending of light rays predicted by Einstein was actually observed for the first time. So light too is subject to gravity? Exactly. So what then becomes of our universal reference grid? It's still a network of light, but it is curved, bent by gravity. Its luminous architecture reveals the very shape of space-time. All celestial bodies are wedded to its curvature. It's as if gravity shaped the universe. Yes. Gravity is not just a force, it's the very geometry of the universe. It is curved space-time which unites space, time, light and gravity. That's what we call general relativity. Freedom, ultimately, is the possibility of choosing one path rather than another, or not to choose at all. possible concepts of freedom. That before Einstein, which made a distinction between unfree bodies subject to gravity and free bodies which escape gravity. That is, a distinction between the massive bodies of the universe on the one hand and light on the other. The other conception, Einstein's, asserted on the contrary all bodies, including light, were free, but in a space-time shaped by gravity. This freedom is therefore relative. Yes. A bit like these particles, they're free of all forces, but they cannot leave the surface over which they move. They are at once free and constrained, like celestial objects. So freedom is, in fact, a question of perspective. And of geometry. Celestial objects are free, but guided by the curved shape of space-time, like a path of a boat over the surface of the sea which follows the undulations of the waves. In fact, 
we lack the objectivity to appreciate our curved world. Exactly. On our scale, the universe seems flat. Just like the Earth seems flat. Just like it seemed flat to our ancestors. of mathematicians and physicists, this is how we write curvature. It's the equation discovered by Einstein. R mu nu equals chi t mu nu. Wonderful. Very poetic. But what exactly does it mean? R represents the curvature of space-time, and t its content in terms of matter and energy. The greater t is, the more r is curved meaning that curvature increases with matter or density. Curvature is traced out by paths of light. I see. But then, are images of the distant cosmic objects transmitted by light somewhat warped and curved? Indeed they are. Astronomers have observed these cosmic optical illusions caused by the bending of light. Certain distant objects, like quasars, for example, are seen through a massive lens object on the sightline like a galaxy. Thus, their image seems to be curved, doubled, or even multiplied. A veritable mirage. Yes, a mirage which enables us to detect hidden matter in the universe. You see, Curved space-time isn't just a mathematical construction, it's very real. Thanks to it, we're able to penetrate the invisible architecture of the universe. Great! We cannot see space-time, but we know it's like an elastic framework deformed by stars which leave their curved imprint upon it as they move through it. In space-time, shaped by gravity, the denser a star, the more massive a star is, the more it curves the universe. Around it, other curvatures and other trajectories fall into place. by two stars orbiting one around the other. Each star imprints its own curvature on space-time, but the motion of the two stars also generates small waves, which move at the speed of light. These are not light waves, but gravity waves. Like when you throw a pebble into the water. A little like that. Whenever an object is crossed by gravitational waves, it bobs like a cork and becomes completely distorted. Hey, that looks like an eye in the sky. That's a black hole, a totally invisible region of space-time. Invisible? But it's all red. That's the incandescent gas which it swallows up, which glows before disappearing. See, the black hole distorts space around it so much that the images are totally warped. It's as if space-time was soft. That's amazing. But what is a black hole exactly? When a massive star explodes at the end of its life, its center collapses inwards under its own weight. The gravitational attraction then becomes so strong that nothing at all can escape from it. It becomes a black hole which swallows up all that comes near it, even light. But what lies at the bottom of a black hole? An infinitely curved universe. But there, we can but dream. There, 
You've gone beyond the bounds of science.